Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this evening for a conversation with Dean Nichol. Hold on one second. I can hear a ringing. Do you have headphones you could put in by any chance? Me? Uh, oh, is that what's causing this? Can you hear it too? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a feedback loop. I uh, have. Yeah, I've got headphones. Let me see if that works. Does that work? Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay. We were just Go getting ahead. some kind of feedback loop back and forth, I think. Okay, I can, I can hear you, I think. Okay. All right, everybody. Thanks for being patient. My name is Talia. I'm the events manager here at Flyleaf. Before I introduce Jean, I'd love to give you all a quick overview of our virtual events calendar this fall. So beginning in August, we hosted Jill McCorkle and Francis Mays. We've also hosted Ron Rash, as well as the authors of UNC A to Z, Nick Graham and Cecilia Moore. If you missed any of those events, you can watch recordings on our Facebook page, as well as here on our Crowdcast. Um, if you click on Flyleaf Books, on, hover over my face and click on Flyleaf Books, you can um, check out our full lineup for the fall, as well as those past event recordings. Starting with this tonight's event with Jean, we have a lineup of a few authors whose work focuses on social and political issues leading up to the election. So on September 24th, we're hosting Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen for their book, From Here to Equality. And then on October 1st, we're hosting James Leloudis and Robert Korstad for their book, Fragile Democracy. You can find out more about those events and others by checking our Full calendar, once again, uh, flyleafbooks.com slash event or by clicking on our Crowdcast profile. I hope that you all are enjoying our events lineup and continue to join us for future events. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and our guests, please keep in mind that Jean's books are in stock and available for purchase. We have signed copies of Indecent Assembly and Faces of Poverty. You can click the buy button right beneath our faces to get that page. You can also call Flyleaf tomorrow to order over the phone. And if you are interested in throwing us a few dollars to continue to create this programming, we do have donations um, available. Um, we would be really appreciative of that as well. Without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Jean. Jean Nichol is a law professor, editorial commentator, and author of The Faces of Poverty in North Carolina, Stories from Our Invisible Citizens, and other books. He is the Boyd Tinsley Distinguished Professor of Law at UNC and writes commentary for a variety of publications, including the Raleigh NNO, the Charlotte Observer, and the Progressive Populist. We welcome Jean to Flyleaf to talk about the faces of poverty in January 2019, and we're so excited to bring him back for another discussion. Uh, this conversation was supposed to happen earlier this spring, but obviously circumstances intervened, and we are happy that we can make it happen even virtually. Jean's new book, Indecent Assembly, focuses on the North Carolina legislature's descent into ideological extremism and in many cases, outright bigotry at the expense of many North Carolinians, including people of color, women, impoverished folks, the LGBT community, immigrants, and other marginalized groups. 
the scariest part about this takeover is not necessarily that it happened, but that Jean argues it has become a blueprint for national far right politics. In the middle of a heated election season, this issue could not be more crucial. I'm going to pass the mic over to Gene and mute my video for a bit so that he can tell us about the book, the issues, and hopefully a little bit about what we can do to steer our state back to decency. Thank you so much, Gene. Thank you, Talia. Uh, that's uh, very kind. Uh, is the sound about right or? I hear a yeah, little bit. Yeah, we can hear you. Echo. You're good. Okay. Uh, it is great to be at Flyleaf, uh, even if virtually. It is my favorite bookstore, uh, my local bookstore. Uh, we did, as Talia mentioned, uh, uh, a book event a couple years ago uh, when I wrote the poverty book. And we did a lot of bookstore events, but this was my favorite uh, by far. It's nice being home chapel hill the coolest place except i know some people think carborough is the coolest place but uh, uh i am delighted to join everyone and i hope to see some friends in a second it's this is a book about north carolina politics and about what we face in north carolina and that's no doubt what i'm going to talk about uh, i can't help mentioning though that this is a day that we have learned that the President of the United States lied to us about the dangers of COVID and told us to risk our lives and risk our children's lives and risk our students' lives. Phil Berger seems to think the same thing. Uh, and did it purposely? Uh, lied to us in the process. Douglas Brinkley, the great American historian, said today that this is the greatest presidential crime in American history. And our own uh, Republican delegation seems untroubled by it. Uh, tonight, as Mike Pence is apparently at a QAnon meeting, plotting and lying for Jesus. Uh, these are odd times. Those are national matters. We have our own challenges at home and that's what I'm gonna talk about. But it is impossible not to mention the tragic clown show in DC. But in decent assembly. The broad theme of the Gene, you've dropped out. Am I back? Sorry I'm about that. I'm oh. sorry, folks. Okay. Sorry, you dropped out for a second. Okay. Uh, <laughs> As I was starting to say, the broad theme of the indecent assembly has been told well and pervasively. North Carolina once considered a beacon of farsightedness in the South and a paragon of Southern moderation, as it's been described, has since 2011, but especially since 2013, undergone a powerful Republican revolution. A state, as the national folks have put it, long dominated by business-minded, moderate Democrats has been turned politically upside down. A complex stew resulting from the rise of an assertive Tea Party, the weakening of a corruption-plagued Democratic Party, the massive investments of right-wing political donors and an ascendant backlash against the election of Barack Obama led to a Republican takeover of both houses of our General Assembly in the 2010 election, as everybody knows, 
For two years, Democratic Governor Bev Perdue acted as a modest counterweight to the boldest Republican ambitions. But Pat McCrory won the governor's race in 2012, giving Republicans uncontestable control over all three branches of government for the first time since 1870. That grip included veto-proof majorities in both houses. McCrory quickly proved that he was no match for the legislative leaders, even if he wanted to be. And the state lawmakers were not about to sit on their hands. So a cascade of changes quickly came to us. Strict voter regulations aimed at curtailing turnout, repeal of racial justice guarantees, new and generous school voucher programs, potent and demeaning abortion restrictions, expansive new gun rights, attacks on teacher tenure and representation, dramatic cuts to K-12 and higher education, business-friendly environmental regulations, internationally derided anti-LGBT measures, brutal cuts to an array of social programs meant to assist the poor, consistent opposition to Obamacare and Medicare expansion, the largest cut to a state unemployment compensation program in American history, massive tax breaks for the wealthiest Tar Heels, accompanied by tax increases for low-income workers. This whole package was safeguarded by the most aggressive racial and political gerrymandering ever witnessed in the United States by direct and relentless attacks on the independence of the North Carolina courts, by rarely before seen intrusions on local government prerogative, by violations of long-established boundaries of separate powers and fulsome attacks on democracy itself. Powerful Senate leader Ralph Hise could accurately brag that by 2016, North Carolina General Assembly had amassed, quote, the most conservative record of any state legislature in the nation. The Dean of North Carolina political columnist, Rob Christensen, wrote that there's been a bigger and quicker shift to the right here than in any other state in the country. The New York Times decried what it called North Carolina's pioneering work in bigotry. The Washington Post said that the General Assembly had turned back 50 years of progress on civil rights and gutted the social safety net. Other states began to follow what was overtly deemed the North Carolina playbook and the New York Times Magazine frantically asked in a now Trump-based era, is North Carolina the future of American politics? So that's my starting point. In a very short period of time, really four or five years, North Carolina moved from a beacon of Southern progress to what national newspapers now readily call a laboratory for extremism, a poster child for regressive conservative policies, first. Second, and to remind us, North Carolina citizens did not sit idly by as their state government was brutally recast. A massive Moral Monday protest movement was launched and executed in response. Following the creation of a potent and active HK on J coalition by Reverend William J. Barber in 2007, Moral Monday leaders started weekly protests at the State House in April 2013. That day, Barber and 16 others were arrested for 
peacefully challenging the unfolding Republican legislative crusade, defying what Reverend Barber called regressivism on steroids. Soon thousands joined the ranks week after week, gathering in huge throngs in Raleigh and across North Carolina. In February 2014, Morrill Monday drew more than 100,000 people to the steps of the legislative building, making it likely the largest racial justice rally in the South since the Selma to Montgomery March of 1965. Republican leaders called the multiracial protesters, outside agitators, old hippies and morons, echoing the responses of 1960s Southern segregationists. By 2014, more than a thousand people had been arrested at statehouse protest. Barber told the demonstrators, we can no longer allow the ultra conservatives to have the moral megaphone. If you're going to change the nation, you've got to change the South. And if you're going to change the South, you've got to focus on these legislatures. Moral Monday didn't drive Republicans from control of the General Assembly, but it had potent impact in North Carolina and beyond. First, the protest worked to thwart and slow the unimpeded reign of the new legislature. Republican leaders sought to enact dramatic economic, legal, and social change without significant pushback or debate. Democratic law leaders were largely powerless to stop the cuscade. If Republicans aim to remake North Carolina without, Republic, without troubling controversy, the protest made that impossible. They also revitalized the state Democratic Party. Barber always made sure that Moral Monday remained a moral rather than a partisan crusade. But as Democratic pollster Tom Jensen put it, Barber really stepped in to fill the void of progressive leadership for Democrats when they had been put completely in the wilderness. Thanks largely to the demonstrations, McCrory's approval ratings dropped notably. He'd won by 12 points in 2012, but by the end of the next summer, his approval ratings were decidedly underwater. Democrat Roy Cooper nearly beat McCrory in 2016. He wouldn't have done so without the emotionally charged and pervasively visible protests. Democrats regained enough seats in 2018 to eliminate the Republican supermajorities, dominating both houses. The same could be said of those campaigns, I think. Cranky Republican leaders complained the Moral Monday crowd gave Democratic voters a reason to be excited and to be active and to vote. Maybe most important, the Moral Monday protests helped convince North Carolina and later the country at large that an invigorated engagement in the democratic process provides the surest basis to secure the society that they hope to achieve. All that said, Republicans still held significant majorities in both houses in the General Assembly after the 2018 elections. Today, they enjoy a 66 to 55 edge in the House and a 29 to 21 lead in the Senate. The laws of North Carolina are still launched from the Republican caucuses in each chamber. The Republican lawmakers retain the distorted security of grotesquely gerrymandered electoral districts. On occasion now, thankfully, the products of Republican lawmakers may be constrained by a bolstered gubernatorial veto, but the North Carolina General Assembly remains, first to last, a Republican outfit, following the same destructive agenda 
it's pursued the last eight years, an agenda that has inflicted potent damage on the people of North Carolina and that directly threatens their children's futures. That agenda is the focus of this book. I concentrate on the legislative record of the Republican General Assembly for two reasons. The first is simple. Though much has been written of particular legislative programs and areas of focus for Republican lawmakers, little study seeks to examine the agenda of the General Assembly more broadly. It's one thing to read of day-by-day -day accretions and extensions. No doubt they alone can spark outrage. But it's another matter to see a decade's accumulation laid out in a package. When I began studying the General Assembly's record, it was uh, probably fair to say I was a member of the determined, perhaps even angered, opposition. Studying the lawmakers' work as a whole, though, can readily move one past that comparatively less alarmed state. As my friend, historian Dan Carter says, whenever he's asked about what's happening in North Carolina and whether it's as bad as it looks, Dan always says it's worse. It's a whole lot worse than you think. My second reason is more important. It has to do with the nature of the General Assembly's crusade, the categories and themes and beachheads of their assault, what they repeatedly show they are out to accomplish. Characterizations of the work product of the North Carolina legislature typically run along traditional headings of punditry, liberal conservative, left right, moderate radical, and the like. And there is some accuracy, no doubt, in these labels. But they can also miss the basics, the defining, undergirding essentials. I argue that since 2011, the North Carolina General Assembly has waged the stoutest war against people of color and low-income citizens seen in the United States in a half century. All white Republican caucuses dominating both houses have behaved essentially like a white people's party, attacking the participatory rights, anti-discrimination guarantees, educational opportunities, and equal dignity of African Americans. Poor Tar Heels have been similarly targeted. They've been demonized and shamed and economically penalized, essentially treated as outcasts to the Commonwealth, deserving disdain rather than brotherhood. In the process, the General Assembly has acted as reverse Robin Hood, using the power of government to restrict the resources, opportunities, and life chances of the poor in order to bestow unneeded largesse on the rich. Women have been repeatedly denied equal dignity in reproductive decisions that effectively deny their full and functioning humanity in favor of a patronizing and authoritarian state decision maker enforcing its own vision of a meaningful life on diminished subjects. The General Assembly has also moved to officially disparage and debilitate and demean lesbian, gay, and transgender Tar Heels to brand them as strangers, denying their membership and endangering their prospects. Public education and the environment have experienced similar insider-outsider demarcations, favoring the powerful at the expense of the marginalized and the burden, and directly attacking notions of public obligation and public good. These bold and singular steps can accurately be characterized as ultra-conservative and extreme. But foundationally, they represent something more 
a broad animating war on equality, seeking to undo much of the mandate of the modern Equal Protection Clause. They constitute an overarching attack on the 14th Amendment itself, the most consequential provision of the United States Constitution, and they should be seen as such. The Civil War Amendment's principal author sought to assure, and I quote, equal justice for any person, no matter whence he comes or how poor, how weak, how simple, how friendless. The North Carolina General Assembly's actions constitute a bold and unrelenting crusade against that defining ideal. And Republican lawmakers have not stopped there. They haven't been satisfied with powerful and sustained alterations of our substantive legal regime, the rights and duties of Tar Heels. They've also attacked the foundations of American constitutional government, independent judicial review, separation of powers, the rule of law, the operational values of democracy itself. The General Assembly has interfered with the judicial election process, limited judicial review of legislative acts, manipulated the size of the Court of Appeals for partisan purposes, aided Republican candidates in Supreme Court races, interfered with gubernatorial appointment powers, threatened disobedient judges with shortened terms, canceled judicial primaries, gerrymandered the districts of disfavored judges, and much more. The entire state judiciary is literally under assault. Republicans have also used legislative powers more ruthlessly than any other state assembly to tilt the democratic process in their direction. They passed the most aggressive voter suppression and political gerrymandering plans in a half century. They specialized in sore loser laws, overturning the results of local elections when unhappy with the choices of the voters. They've even been willing to cast aside democracy's most foundational rule. If you lose an election, you respect the will of the voters and you move on. Our General Assembly chose instead to dramatically diminish the authorities of the governor and the attorney general's offices when their favored candidates didn't prevail. No need to turn the keys to the governor's mansion over to one successor, the theory goes. Just burn the house down. Democratic norms are apparently just for losers. All that matters is power. Finally, in an effort to conceal their crusade against equality and democracy, the General Assembly has repeatedly and unapologetically abandoned truth itself. That's not my opinion, or just my opinion, but it is the frequent, explicit, and determined finding of state and federal courts. Lying about legislative motivation defeats the possibility of deliberative discourse and demands that reviewing courts label our lawmakers as effective perjurers. It reveals an inexcusable cynicism about democratic power and an absence of character so potent it marks them unfit for office. It is possible to characterize these assaults on democracy and equality and judicial review as radical or extreme, or I guess even as ultra-conservative, which is what Republicans seem to think they are. But the General Assembly's war on equality and its demolition of democratic and constitutional norms is actually a rejection of the structures and foundational premises of the American experiment itself. These power-grabbing moves don't reflect the normal give-and-take 
of traditional politics. They challenged the foundations, the fundaments of our premises of governance. I've long been taken with that word, fundaments. It means broadly, basic principle, the underlying foundation or theory of a system. But it can also suggest a base or foundation, especially of a building, the fundaments upon which we have built. Foundations of governance, like judicial independence, the rule of law, separation of powers, these have taken us centuries to develop. Casting them out in a temporary craving for power mocks our history and the bold legacy of our forebears. It sells our meaning and our sacrifice for an ill-intentioned mess of pottage. It breaks the most important promises that we have made to one another as a people. It ought to be deemed beyond the aspiration of even a power-hungry legislature. A rejection of our fundaments is more serious business than merely being careless or mistaken or hyperzealous or simply wrong. It is more scornful of our story, our meaning, more contrary to the red, white, and blue. It assumes that all that matters is the temporary authority of a favored partisan grouping, not the norms that define us as a people. It is, not to put too fine a point on it, profoundly unpatriotic. This means that the political battle now being waged in North Carolina is not only brutal, it is defining. The stakes are larger than ideological ascendancy. They touch, perhaps even permanently, the character we seek as a people. Republican leaders don't campaign as crusaders for an altered vision of the American constitutional scheme of government. But that platform is increasingly what they carry out, regardless of what they might say. So this political war in North Carolina is about more than politics. It is about the promises that constitute us as a commonwealth, our constitutive assurances to one another, our hard secured traditions of governance, our character as a people, a core struggle for our own decency. This is a book about the politics of North Carolina, but it's also a warning beacon for other states. The New York Times has claimed North Carolina experienced its political cataclysm a few years ahead of the rest of the country. The Atlantic has written that nowhere is the battle between liberal and conservative visions of government fiercer than in North Carolina. Vox added, North Carolina became a playbook for Republicans across the country. Our own congressman here, also a thoughtful political scientist, has argued that we have become exhibit A of our country's political trends and tragedies. The nation's best election law expert has written that North Carolina set a precedent in playing a kind of hardball that we haven't seen in other places. Does it spiral out of control, he asked. It has been more asymmetric with Republicans, but I don't think it would always stay that way. In other words, what's happening in Raleigh may not stay in Raleigh. Robert Kennedy said at Berkeley in 1966, that the future belongs to those who can blend passion, reason, and courage in a personal commitment to the ideals and enterprises of the American democracy. What was for Kennedy a description of the world that he thought he saw unfolding around him has become for us a manifesto and a prayer. And clearly, right now, a call to arms. Let me stop there, Talia, unless we can open it up for questions.
Wow. <laughs> Speaker. All right. We have a few questions coming in already. If you want to ask a question and you haven't done so already, you can drop it in the chat or you can go to this ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to find that um, option and then we can go ahead with some questions. All right. We have a question here from Asia. I'm wondering how it could be legal for a state government to alter local elections. For example, could you explain a bit about the mechanism by which North Carolina General Assembly attempted to alter Greensboro City Council elections? Well, uh, it, it shouldn't be legal. It certainly shouldn't be legal when it's done for the reasons that uh, it has been pursued here. In fact, the alteration of the Greensboro elections was overturned by the federal courts because the court ruled once again that it reflected race discrimination. The principal purpose behind changing the districts and the makeup of the city council in Greensboro, the court held, was to dislodge successful black candidates. So that was held to be unconstitutional. Those of you from Wake County will know that the, the, the state legislature tried to overturn the county elections uh, and the county school board elections. And what I mean by overtoning them, uh, they didn't like the results of the election. Like in Wake County, there was a virtual sweep uh, by Democrats. And so they said, now we're going to change the districts. We're going to put uh, folks uh, in uh, districts where they'll have to challenge others. We're gonna alter the districts dramatically in order to favor Republicans. Uh, no one asked us to do this. We've done it through a, a sort of abrogated, uh, quick legislative process, looking at local rules, which can't be uh, vetoed by the governor. Uh, but uh, uh, these through an array of mechanisms, the court, the, con the General Assembly has abused its power to overturn legislative results that it found uncongenial. Mm -hmm. But it's not legal and it shouldn't be legal. <laughs> no, it's not legal. It shouldn't be legal. Uh, I mean, in major part, it's been invalidated because uh, the courts have said uh, among other things, you are doing this to discriminate against black people, and that violates the uh, Voting Rights Act. It violates the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, but that hasn't stopped these folks from undertaking these efforts. Uh, right. The under the argument that we're and we can do whatever it is that we choose. The issue is just how can we hold our state government accountable to the law? <laughs> right. Uh, and we have had uh, relentless violation of the norms, the separation of powers guarantees, the traditional requirements of rule of law, the norms of democracy and non-discrimination by folks who are relentlessly cheating because they, they're not confident that they can hold on to power if we have fair elections. And I think they're probably right. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another question here. Mr. Nickel, thanks so much for writing this book and having this talk. I live in Virginia and we are gradually turning blue. Do you think North Carolina will be affected by the national events of the post office tamperings? I'm worried about it. Uh, I'm worried that we even have a, a remote hand in it because this bird comes from Greensboro, I think. Uh, but I am. Uh, I've got my early ballot, my mail-in ballot. I got it right here on my table. I hope everybody else does too. Uh, we should vote uh, quickly. Uh, I'm even going to take it to the uh, to the drop box myself. Uh, but uh, this, I think, there's every reason to think that our uh, adversaries will abuse the electoral process. They have done it in the past. They have boasted about it. They have changed the 
uh, electoral laws, the ID provisions, the districting process, the polling places, time after time, as the federal courts have ruled with surgical precision to cheat against full access to the democratic process. Uh, I, that's the point of this book in large part. People like me think, and they have for a long time, there's going to be a lot of give and take in regular democratic process. There'll be liberals and conservatives. There'll be folks who are strong environmentalists. There'll be folks who uh, powerfully support public education and those who don't. But we also think, and we have thought for decades now, that we also have a lot of givens. We have foundational requirements about the operation of the American constitutional democracy. We, we don't think, for example, that people will spend their powerful efforts trying to stop people from being able to vote. I think we have assumed that Americans sort of agreed that we ought to have fair elections and we ought to have uh, open access to the voting process. Turns out that's not right. I wouldn't have guessed in 2020 you would have a legislature who would go into its all-white caucuses and pass laws which are meant to disenfranchise black voters in North Carolina. And that they would brag about it, they would claim that that's part of their admirable legacy, trying to build a bridge to 1952, I guess. But that's what we have. I wouldn't have thought that you could have a majority party in an American, nation, American state, which would say a big part of our goal is to stop people from being able to vote. We want to limit the exercise of the franchise. Uh, that's a big part of how we define ourselves. I thought we were past that. I thought we were past overt, intentional discrimination on the basis of race announced out of all white caucuses and assumed to be uh, 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 something that we would admit to and accept. But that, in fact, is where we are. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that in the wealthiest country on earth, we would have a government which took as one of its principal goals the targeting of the poorest members of its society. We are already the most economically unequal nation in the world. They apparently don't think that's good enough. They got to step on the necks of poor people a little more adventurously. So I wouldn't have thought these set of values would resurrect themselves. Uh, but we are in a dark time. We have been in a dark time for a decade. And the only way we're going to get out of it is to outnumber these folks, out-organize these folks, and we're going to have to out-organize them by quite a bit. Because we all know in North Carolina, you probably can't hope to win with a 52-48 margin. You've got to have something much more substantial than that. Because we've had folks who for a decade have been setting their political compass to cheat because they're pretty worried that you won't be able to govern as an all-white party and an all-white caucus in the next decade and the next day and after that. So the way you're going to hold on to it is to cheat and to make sure people don't actually get the effective operation of the American democracy. That is a violation of the American promise. It is a violation of what we call patriot what we call patriotism. It is the sense that Americans define themselves through a commitment to equality and to liberty and to constitutional principle. These folks throw that out. It's un-American, it's unpatriotic, and it is a rejection of what we have taken long to build and for what we have sacrificed much. It has to be rejected. And if we don't reject it this time, I worry that it'll become too late. We would have done too much damage to the North Carolina constitutional structure and its belief in democracy. Mm -hmm. I have a question from here, here from John that sort of relates. Um, 
Speaking of organizing an opposition, you spoke of corruption in the Democratic Party of North Carolina. Can you describe and what is the status of the party at present? Well, it's better, I hope, I think it is. Uh, we have, we've got a strong governor. We've got a lot of activism in the Democratic Party, but it's important too, to remember uh, a massive uh, record of, uh, which has included a lot of failures. Uh, uh, we have had uh, uh, scandals in our leadership, folks going to jail. We have had scandals in uh, the governorship. Uh, we have not uh, put our strongest foot forward. We have also done something else, which uh, I find immensely distressing. We have, in the last 30 years, largely ignored the intense poverty amidst our plenty here. Uh, I think uh, poor folks in North Carolina have learned in the last decade that there's one thing worse than being ignored by your government, that is you can be targeted by your government, penalized directly, directly hindered and diminished by your government. But it's uh, not fair to ignore uh, how little credence uh, Democrats in the last uh, two decades have given to the, uh, the traumas of poverty in North Carolina. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I tell you what, uh, there's only one direction to look here. Uh, we uh, think about this, this is 2020. I know people think I'm uh, joking or I'm uh, uh, exaggerating when I say that these Republican leaders go into caucuses and write our laws, caucuses which are all white. Who would believe that? We have 23% African-Americans in North Carolina, almost 40% people of color. And yet an all white caucus goes into its closed meetings, does it work, and unsurprisingly, comes out and enact laws which the federal courts tell us represent surgical precision to try and diminish the participatory rights of African Americans. Uh, we have a white people's party that governs like a white people's party. I have been told and warned repeatedly that it is rude to mention that. Apparently it is not rude to have a white people's party, white people's caucus, white people's government, but it is rude to mention it. So uh, uh, the question is, are we gonna take a, a diverse, a pluralistic uh, party like the Democratic Party, which is aimed at giving all folks an equal chance? Or are we gonna rally around some sort of Confederate version of politics and think that that's uh, what's appropriate for North Carolina's future. I don't see how you could have a clearer choice. Right, absolutely. Um, let's see what the next question I have is here from Denise. How do we convince Republican voters who watch conservative news and speak with fellow conservatives of what is happening here? They hear different news, which says the opposite of this is happening. They do. Uh, and we have a large problem across the board of folks paying attention to the only their favored uh, mediums and the like. It's also true to be candid. Uh, Fox News is not reporting a lot one way or another about what's happening in North Carolina. Uh, but it's our job. It's tough work, but it's our job to convince people to let them know exactly what's happening in North Carolina. My own sense of it is most North Carolinians don't actually support this notion of a white people's government. They don't support demeaning women. They don't support uh, demeaning lesbians and gay men. They are not out to crucify poor people. And they think everybody ought to be able to vote and that we ought to have courts and independent courts and judicial review. And I don't think that they think it's a good idea to have legislators who constantly and repeatedly lie about what they're doing. But most folks, to be candid, most folks don't know about this. Most folks 
don't want to pay attention to politics. I don't blame them. It, it can be a nasty business. Most folks, you know, they're thinking, I, I'm having a hard time making ends meet. Uh, or now with the COVID even worse, uh, it's difficult enough to take care of my kids and to move forward sort of one uh, step forward at a time. I don't want to pay attention to politics. I also am not inclined to believe that it's as bad as people like Nickel say it is. Now, I wish it wasn't. We are in a literal fight for our own decency, for our democracy, for our notion of equality, for our future as an American people. That's literally true. There is no denying it. But uh, people don't broadly want to pay attention to such matters. And they don't want to think that things are as bad as that. They also don't want to think that their leaders are actually out to ditch the North Carolina commitment to democracy. But that is what they are after. That's what's happening. It's repeatedly shown. Uh, we're able to know a lot more about it because the federal and state courts have documented so much of it. But it's our job to make this point known. Let, let me give you an example of the way I think of this. I travel around North Carolina a lot. I have for a long time. I'm convinced of this. I don't think this is very controversial. I'm convinced that North Carolinians believe very heavily in public education. They think it has been central to North Carolina's development. What we would have said in the old days was the reason North Carolina is not South Carolina is because of our commitment to public education. Now, now we, we might wish we were South Carolina. I don't, I'm not making a point there. But North Carolinians are committed to public education. That's true. It's also true that for the last decade, our General Assembly has embarked upon a bold crusade to destroy public education. I could go through it uh, chapter and verse, but it basically has meant strangling public education, humiliating public education, while you open wild new exit doors to private schools through generous voucher programs and utterly and completely unaccountable private schools. That's the goal. The goal of the Republicans has been for this decade to demolish public education. They'd be happy. They, what they want to do is they want people to go to private schools, maybe private religious schools, and they want to pay for it, even uh, if there's no reason uh, to do that. Now, that's been clearly shown. I don't think that's really subject to being contested. I don't think North Carolinians would support that. But here's what I worry is going to happen. Ten years, North Carolinians are going to look up and say, God damn it, someone has destroyed our public schools. I need public schools. I believe in schools. When did they do this? And then there will be some activists who will say, don't you remember we told you that they were destroying your public schools? Not me, but people with more credibility. Uh, and they say, well, I wasn't paying attention. I had too much work to do. I was uh, trying to get my kids uh, ready to go to college or to uh, uh, get a job and the like. And then I think they're going to be much pissed that so much damage has been done to public schools because you won't be able to readily repair it. Uh, but I don't think most people know that. Uh, and I think that indicates the, the sort of burden of what we've got to do. We have to explain a set of unlikely facts that people who are governing our legislature are doing it in ways that foundationally violate the principles, the premises, and the values of the people of North Carolina. They uh, brag about it on the national stage. And they are doing immense, irrevocable harm. Uh, so this can't be allowed to go forward. I, I wish that the stakes were not as high as they are. I wish that we weren't in a fight for equality and democracy and decency and dignity. But we are. And it doesn't do any good to pretend that we're not. 
It is what it is. It's what we face. It's time for all hands on board. You can either ignore it and contribute to our own destruction, or you can organize and you can work and you can vote and you can organize again to make sure that uh, the Democrats prevail in this race. Speaking to the, the difference between the people who aren't paying attention necessarily and the people who are, I have a question here from Bob. There have been successful legal challenges to the General Assembly's attack on the electoral process. Can you talk about how both protesters and lawyers have helped contain this undemocratic legislature? Yes, uh, it's, that's crucial. And it's sort of odd when you think about it. Um, for one thing, protesters, uh, North Carolina's response to this anti-democratic and anti-egalitarian crusade has been seen much in the streets. And that has, I can say, as one who's participated a little bit in it, uh, it is uh, demanding and difficult work, but it is inspiring, it is energizing, and it reminds us that this is a democracy controlled by those at the bottom. Now, let me say a word about the lawyers. I work with them some, but uh, mainly I watch in amazement from a distance and I try to write about what they've done. When you think about this, think of this crucial work. Our democracy is being attacked, debilitated. Our claims to equality are being submerged and wounded potently. Who fixes that? Who, who steps in and says to these villains, thou shalt go no further? Well, it, it's not done by the government, typically speaking. It's not done by the police department. It is done by volunteers. The, I work a lot and been honored to work a lot with the NAACP. Think of the lawsuits the NAACP has filed and prevailed on. Uh, think of the work of Common Cause, which has done so much to try to resurrect the North Carolina democracy, winning, thankfully, lawsuit after lawsuit. There are others, uh, Anita Earl's great work before she went on the bench. It's funny that in the United States, when it comes to one of our most important ventures, saving the democracy, that that's got to be done by these small nonprofits that, you know, they don't have three dimes to rub together. They're out there begging folks to help them out. And if they didn't do it, then the suppression stands. So uh, it's funny that we turn to volunteers to do, to do our most essential work. But that's what we're doing. And in North Carolina, uh, there has been a great deal of success. There's much heroism. There is tremendous uh, expertise in a civil rights bar. And there are folks willing to turn to the street to say, this is not what I believe North Carolina exists to be. Here's one way of looking at what's happening to us. These folks are very clear about what they want to do. Ralph Hayes would say, well, he, he's very happy that we have the most right-wing record in the United States of any state government. But what they really mean is they want to out Mississippi, Mississippi. They want to out Alabama, Alabama. They want to out Louisiana, Louisiana. They want North Carolina to be the most right-wing, oppressive, civil rights-denying, white people's government in the United States. And they have been immensely successful in pushing us in that direction. The question is whether we're going to put up with it. We're going to allow it. Because frankly, there ain't anybody who can stop it but us. I wish that the fight wasn't as 
essential as it is. It wasn't as sort of brutal as it is that it was, there wasn't so much at stake. But, uh, you know, I, when I'm talking to my students, I try to remind them sometimes when we're outside the classroom uh, that uh, this is not the first time that folks have had to struggle against odds in order to assure human decency and constitutional propriety. I am pretty sure that uh, Fannie Lou Hamer didn't do an opinion poll before she started the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I don't think that Rosa Parks conducted a focus group before she sat down for freedom. I know that Cesar Chavez didn't ask if it would be lauded or approved before he launched his famed hunger strike. He said instead, si, si se puede. This is not the first time people of strong character have been called to fight for justice against the odds. North Carolina has done it before. North Carolina knows how to do it. We don't need anybody to teach us, but it's going to take all our effort. It takes unreasonable levels of effort because it is easy enough for forces of greed and suppression to tilt the rules in their favor. And it's only our energy and our feet which can work to defeat it. But we got to defeat it because it's our vision of the state of North Carolina that's on the line. I have a couple more questions for you. I think we're going to do two more and then wrap up. I know we have a lot more than that in the question um, box, but we don't have unlimited time, unfortunately. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll ask. I'll try to be quicker. Um, <laughs> I know I get wound up. And what I'm sorry gives about you? That. <laughs> no worries. We love to hear it. Um, what gives you hope about the upcoming election? Um, one, I, this is an odd response, but I spend a lot of time working in low income communities in North Carolina. And whenever I spend time with folks who are working in such venues or who are struggling with them, I come back energized, amazed at their resilience and steel and refusal to bend. I also spend some time with those who organize in North Carolina, who uh, turn out on our streets, and they can be remarkable and bold and inspiring. I also know a lot of folks who have been in North Carolina a long time. They've been through the fights here. They've lived our history here. They did not believe that we would be once again dealing with folks who were trying to overtly embrace race discrimination as a part of their political charter. They didn't think we would once again be struggling to try and integrate successfully our public schools. They did not think we would have a government that was trying to brutalize the poorest among us. They thought North Carolina had pushed past that. So this has all been a shock to them, a shock to a lot of longtime North Carolinians. And I think they're awakened to it. They are pissed. They're not willing to accept it. This is not the state that they have struggled to find and that they believe that their children deserve to enjoy, and they are going to fight to change it. I have one sort of last basis of optimism, and this is a horrible one. The COVID has demonstrated to us the unbelievable chasms within this society, demonstrated to us along with this great racial awakening, how powerfully we have violated our claimed premise of equality. Here's one way to think about it. Maybe I mentioned this. Thomas Piketty, the great uh, international inequality scholar, wrote a couple years ago that the United States now has the greatest income inequality 
of any nation, any place on the globe, any time in human history. Number one, ever. Most unequal. Now, I tell people, maybe Pickett is wrong a little bit. You can argue with him. Maybe we're only the second worst in human history. But it is a gigantic violation of what we say we believe in. That has become so apparent to us through this economic trauma, through this healthcare trauma, through this brutal violation of racial equality, through the constant killing of African Americans, that it, this is apparent to everyone. It can't be denied. It can't be honestly denied. So I have a modest hope that we will stand up and say, well, by God, we pledged 150 years ago in the 14th Amendment not to do this. We pledged equality. Like Dr. King said, all we want you to do is do what you put on paper. Okay. Maybe we're going to start doing what we put on paper. And we have claimed to be the home and the bastion of liberty and equality. But what we have lived is a grotesque rejection of that. I think that's apparent to all. And it is my fondest hope. And I think there's some justification in looking at it. That our departure from that is so brutal, so obvious, so defining, that we're going to, in sufficient numbers, rise up to reject it and say, well, maybe there is something to this notion of equal justice under law. Maybe there is something to what we pledge of liberty and justice for all. Maybe we shouldn't just acknowledge it in the breach. Maybe we ought to live up to it. Maybe we ought to believe the things that we teach our kids. Believe them and make them real. Ty, are we still here? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, Hey folks. Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> this is Jamie. I was working in the Hi, back. Jamie. Talia just yelled to me saying, can you help me out? Um, <laughs> I've enjoyed the talk greatly and I'm, I'm thrilled to see so many people watching. Um, I think Talia had one more question and I'm trying to figure out which one she had. Boy, I'm gonna be happy to put this here in our rear view mirror for all sorts of reasons, right? <laughs> me too, me too. Well, look, um, why don't we just, why don't we just end with this? Uh, okay. I'm uh, honored uh, to be able to talk to so many people. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Flyleaf. Uh, we all know how important independent bookstores are. You know how important Flyleaf is. And these are the toughest of times. I can't, I can't imagine tougher times when you can't even really effectively open your doors. So, Let's help them out. Let's uh, uh, do business with them. Let's buy their books. Let's <laughs> even send a little bit to help with their programming. I'm very grateful to get the chance to visit with folks here at home. And so, uh, Jamie, thanks to you guys. Uh, and uh, it's been an honor to be with you. 
Well, it's an honor to host, host folks like you and, and thanks so much for making yourself available. And I appreciate the shout out. We can use all the support folks are willing to give us, but thanks again for your sharing your thoughts. You bet. All right. Good night, thanks everybody. everyone so much. Thanks.